so next up, we have uh, Kostya, uh, going to give a uh, lightning talk. Good afternoon. I hope you are a little bit awake. Uh, but to, to make you more awake, let me uh, ask you a couple of questions. First of all, how many of you care about C++ applications, stability and security? Too little. Ra everyone, please raise your hands. Because you, you do care about stability and security of C++ applications, even if you don't develop them yourselves. How many of you have fuzzed something in the past, C++ or not? Okay, at least some of you in the audience know what fuzzing is. Uh, I'll talk about fuzzing, and I'll talk about uh, one particular tool to do fuzzing, and I'll have a tiny live demo today. Uh, so what is fuzzing? Why do you want to fuzz? What do you want to fuzz? How do you want to fuzz? A little bit about, about the particular uh, fuzzing tool uh, and the live demo. Uh, let's go. So what, what is fuzzing? Uh, you can define it in many ways, but essentially it is uh, an infinite loop of uh, create a test input for your application and feed it into your application. There are two things you want, uh, you want to get out of, out of fuzzing. First, you want to crash your application. So if you, if you crash your application, you found a bug. Even if you don't crash your application, you still grow code coverage overall, and you can use the, 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 the corpus you've grown uh, for regular regression testing. Why would you like, why would you want to fuzz something? First of all, uh, C++ uh, offers you many unique ways to shoot yourself into the feed, like buffer overflows, uh, use of the free integer overflows, and some such. And fuzzing is a very efficient way to find uh, such C or C++ specific bugs. Uh, but even if you're not using C++, uh, you're using some safer and slower language like, I don't know, a any other, uh, <laughs> you, you may still have divide by zero, you may still have uh, null the reference, you may still have assertion failures, uh, you may have concurrency bugs, you may have bugs that cause your application to consume too much uh, resources, CPU memory or network bandwidth or whatever. Uh, sometimes actually fuzzing may f uh, allow you to find logical bugs as well. Uh, what to fuzz? The, the usual suspect for fuzzing uh, is any application or any library that consumes untrusted data. So anything that consumes files from the internet or from users, anything that monitors the network activity, which accounts to more or less anything, right? Uh, there are two specialized uh, targets, uh, operation system kernels and uh, UI applications, and I'm not touching those two. How to fuzz? One of uh, very popular ways to fuzz uh, is to apply some kind of uh, application-specific generation-based uh, rule. For example, if you know the syntax of, of the files that your application consumes, you can generate files that follow this syntax. And this approach has been very, very useful in, in, in many cases at Google and outside, but I'm not touching this today. Another approach is called mutation-based fuzzing. Uh, this is when you already have a set of valid inputs or invalid inputs for your application, and you start mutating uh, random inputs in random ways and feeding these inputs into your application. Uh, and sometimes mutations could be as simple as bit flipping, Sometimes mutations are much more complex. And this approach is also very powerful, but if we make a little, uh, one tiny step to improve it, it, it will become much more efficient, like orders of magnitude, and we've seen it in, in, in many cases. So the, the tiny step is called guided mutation fuzzing. And by guided, I mean that we use code coverage to guide both the mutation and the extension of, of the corpus. The, the workflow is as follows. You build your application with uh, some kind of coverage instrumentation. So every time you execute an input uh, with the application, you know what parts of the application have been touched. And then you start mutation fuzzing. If some of the mutations caused new code coverage to, uh, to appear, you say, oh, this is a good input, it touched uh, part of application that the, the rest of the test corpus didn't. So we add it back to the corpus. And 
we have lots of evidence that this increases the efficiency of fuzzing by several orders of magnitude. Come on. Yeah. Uh, we are working, uh, we meaning my team right now, uh, are working on a very specific uh, way of fuzzing. We fuzz C and C++ APIs or libraries. We do not right now fuzz large binaries. We do not fuzz services. We fuzz small or medium-sized uh, API, like, API entry points. Uh, you can think of it as uh, unit test-like fuzzing. So we define a thing which we call fuzz target, which is a C function, C function that consumes bytes. And inside that function, you can do whatever you like with these bytes. Uh, basically feed these bytes in one way or another into your library. Uh, who can find the bug on this, uh, on this slide? Yes, correct. So on this slide, you have uh, C code that given one specific input will trigger a buffer overflow uh, on the line which has, says data sub three equals Z. Uh, can everyone see the bug? I leave it here for 10 seconds. Raise your hand when you see the bug. Come on. So, Fuzzer will find this bug much quicker than you. <laughs> there are lots of, uh, there are several fuzzing engines uh, on the market, and the fuzzing engine is the tool that finds inputs uh, that are interesting enough and feeds them into your, uh, into your fuzz target, into your application. Uh, one of them is developed by my team, it's called LeapFuzzer. It's an engine for guided in-process fuzzing. Guided means it, use, it is using code coverage, and in-process means that everything it does, it does in a single process. It does the mutations, and it feeds the inputs into the uh, API and the test all in the same process. It's a library uh, in, in a regular uh, C++ sense, uh, which pro provides a main function. Uh, if you want to use this library, you need to, uh, to build your code with some extra compiler flags that actually do provide the, the code coverage information. Then you link your application uh, with the libfuzzer. Then you, or in parallel or before that, you have to, to find a set of inputs for your application somewhere, a, an initial test corpus. Sometimes it's okay to have initial test corpus empty, but in, in most cases, the, the better test corpus you have, the more efficient fuzzing will be. Uh, and once you have this directory, you just pass this directory as a parameter to the, uh, to the just compiled binary of the fuzzer. This is it. Let me show you some example. Uh, this bug was made public about three or four, uh, four weeks ago. Um, it was a buffer overflow in one of the network, uh, one of the open source network libraries, CARES, and you have the CV and the names on, on the screen. Uh, the bug in that library was a single byte buffer overflow, uh, which overwrote one byte somewhere. Uh, outside of the, of the object. Uh, it caused a full exploit of Chrome OS. Uh, so there, there, there was direct impact for Google, uh, that Google had to pay uh, $100,000 for the researcher who uh, provided us uh, the information. But there was also indirect uh, harm, because who knows, maybe some, someone else has discovered this bug before and was using it against our customers. So this is a pretty nasty, this was a pretty nasty bug, which is now fixed. And all you need to uh, find this bug is on this slide. Everything you need is on this slide. So uh, count how many lines here. Uh, can we switch to demo? Okay, 
So I have, I have a pre-built binary of the, the fuzzer that I've just shown you on the screen. How many of you believe me uh, that I can find a $100,000 uh, worth bug before the end of this talk? Come on. OK. Done. <laughs> so uh, I've started the fuzzer on a single CPU on this laptop. And this is not the most recent laptop. And it started finding uh, new inputs. And on the very left, uh, you may see the numbers. Uh, it's the, the, the most significant uh, digit is eaten, but it basically uh, executed several thousands of inputs before it found an input that triggers a bug. And the bug is heap buffer overflow right of one byte. And here is where. So if, if someone invested uh, 10 lines of code into finding that bug, he would find it instantly, as you have seen. Uh, what, what else is, uh, is convenient about libfuzzer is that once it uh, reports a bug, it also creates a file on disk which has the complete, uh, which, which has the bytes that cause the, uh, the bug to happen. And if you want to uh, reproduce it, can you see it? Yeah. If you want to reproduce the bug, all you need is to feed these bytes again into your uh, target function, like this. And it will happen again. And so you can debug it, you can verify that it's fixed, you can add this input to uh, your regression test suite, etc. cetera. Uh, switch to the uh, slides, please. So. I've just shown you a very, very important, very scary bug that can be found by fuzzing instantly. Fortunately or not, not all scary bugs are like this. Uh, for some bugs, we need to spend hours. For some bugs, we need to sp spend months finding them. And uh, Google has these uh, resources, and Google has, to some extent, humans to do this. Not all open source projects have it. And we're trying to help. Uh, so what, what we want to do? We want uh, every open source project, at least every, every important or every significant open source project, uh, to move away from it has been fuzzed at some point or it has never been fuzzed, to the situation when we can say this project is being continuously fuzzed and we actually know uh, that the coverage produced by the fuzzing is good enough. And for that, we are sti starting to uh, introduce what, what, we called, uh, what we call OSS fuzz, open source uh, fuzzing, which is a fuzzing as a service uh, for important open, uh, open source projects. Uh, it is based on the same fuzzing infrastructure that we're using for Chrome, and that has found many thousands of uh, bugs for, for Chromium so far. Uh, it provides uh, multiple uh, fuzzing engines under the hood, but the, the user shouldn't know about it. Uh, all the user should know is uh, how to interface, uh, how to create a glue be between their project and the OSS fuzz. And this slide, again, is, is an example of uh, such glue. Uh, the, the project is now public, uh, it's on GitHub, and if you own or work with some open source project, you're welcome to participate. Thank you. And I have 55 seconds for questions. Excellent talk. Uh, any questions from the audience? We have one. All right, so uh, in terms of like detecting like memory issues, like like how does this compare against like Valgrind and stuff? Like 
how much effort and time do I have to spend with this tool versus something like Valgrind, which has been out there forever? Uh, forget about Valgrind, uh, use address sanitizer. Uh, but this uh, Valgrind and address sanitizer versus fuzzers are complementary things. You, you cannot find bugs with Valgrind to address sanitizer just by running tests because the tests will not execute the buggy code. You need the fuzzer and the tool like Valgrind to address sanitizer together to find interesting bugs. Um, my question is, uh, how is uh, the actual mutation done? Can you provide some details on that? Uh, we start from bit flipping and byte flipping, those simple things. But also, as, as the uh, fuzzing runs, we gather the statistics about the comparison instructions and uh, library calls, and we actually accumulate a, a, um, a dictionary of tokens that are used by the input language. And then we start feeding these tokens into the input stream. So over time, it gets much more uh, sophisticated than byte flipping and bit flipping. Uh, well, I think that's what, all we have time for, for lightning talks, but thank you, Kostya.